Thank you. Um, so today I'm going to present Sinclair uh, V1, V2 and some um, intriguing uh, properties of contrastive learning. Uh, feel free to interrupt me at any point. So I also want it to be interactive. Um, so let me first go ahead and present Sinclair and some of the finding here, I guess, this has been a year old work, so maybe I will skip some slides. Um, but if you find something that need more clarification, feel free to uh, stop me. Um, okay, so I guess many of you might know that unsupervised representation learning is an important uh, area where typically what people do is that they have a lot of unable data and they want to train some uh, network uh, without any uh, supervision or enables. And then uh, for any like different downstream applications, you can either fine tune or use other ways, uh, other ways of using the feature um, to kind of uh, speed up the, the, the performance of the downstream applications. Um, so in computer vision, there is, uh, there is like two main category of unsupervised learning. Uh, methods. The first one is based on generative modeling. As you might have known, there's autoencoder and the generative uh, GAN uh, for representation learning. And <clears throat> I think, uh, so for this family of methods, like they require to generate pixel level output, which can be computationally expensive sometimes. And another argument is that generating images of a high fidelity might not be necessary uh, for representation learning. So the second category of unsupervised learning is based on discriminative modeling, uh, where you train a network to perform some uh, pretest task, uh, where both input and labels are derived from the unable data sets. So a lot of uh, pr previous uh, pretest task has been um, heuristic based, like notation prediction and uh, relative patch location prediction and colorization stuff. So um, you can see like this, like predicting the orientation of image might not be generalizable for certain images, uh, maybe like satellite images or medical images. So uh, there are some limitation, but they are typically faster to train compared to um, generative based approach. So in this work, we introduce Synclear, which is uh, belong to the second category of methods. So the framework of Synclear is quite simple. Uh, so basically, when, when you have a data example like image, what you can do is you can apply two augmentation to generating uh, to generate two views of the image, and uh, then you for each of the view encoded into the representation, and there is another projection network that uh, map into some latent space where you measure the agreement. And the goal is that you want uh, the augmented view of the same example to agree. Um, so that's basically the, the whole framework. Let me introduce it in, in more detail. So in uh, data augmentation part, which is super important, um, I will show it detail, in the detail later. But here, uh, we simply use two types of augmentation, mainly two types of augmentation. So the first one is random crop, as you can see, the top, uh, so leftmost column is one image and then you crop it uh, using a different random crop and the, and the jitter and the color. So these are the different views generated from the same image as you can see. Okay, now the second encoder network is actually quite uh, um, a network agnostic. So you can use um, a different architecture like ResNet. In, in our work, we use Net ResNet, um, but you can use any other network. Um, to encode the input into representation. And then uh, for the projection network uh, where we take the representation and put project into a space where you can measure um, similarity or agreement uh, is a two layer nonlinear MLP. So the loss function to measure and uh, maximize the agreement. Is there any questions? I have a question, a quick yes, question. Please. Is the base network, the encoding network, uh, pre-trained or not? Yeah, they're both pre-trained on unable data. OK. But then uh, uh, the features are already sufficiently discriminated, right, if, even without the augmentation? 
I'm, I'm oh, anyway. so so my by, so by pre-training, I mean pre-train with this objective, with simply objective. So this will going to be randomly initialized. Okay. Okay. Right. And what's the role of projection head here? I mean, we, we okay, see I, I will see show some results later on. But okay. Yeah, that's a good question. Yeah. Um, but basically, um, we have this kind of separation. When you do fine tuning, you could basically, or you use the feature, you probably want to use H instead of Z, which will be demonstrated in the, in the experiments later. Um, but let's just hold this question briefly for a while. And then basically once you get like for every image, you get one vector out, right? Like this Z, sorry, for every augmented view, you get one uh, vector out Z, and then you want to maximize the agreement. And the way to maximize the agreement is, um, uh, is basically using this contrastive uh, prediction task, which is saying you given one view, uh, one crop of the image, and then you want to predict among a lot of negative examples, which uh, of the augmented view, like crop two, belong like co belong to the corresponding image. So in this case, you can see uh, some examples can be quite difficult, like this crop one and the crop two should be positive, but should be negative with this contrastive image, which is also somewhat similar. And then you have to learn quite fine detail to to distinguish them. Um, so basically the loss function is uh, cross entropy loss because this is essentially a multi-class uh, classification. Um, what we do here is um, we normalize the, the, the Z vector. Um, so at before dot product, so, is, so basically the similarity is a cosine similarity here. And then we uh, weighted by some temperature tau so, so this is somewhat different from the uh, info and C loss, which uh, do not have the, the cosine similarity and, and the temperature tau. Uh, we will show this design choice is actually quite important for learning good features later on. But basically this is just a cross entropy loss. Okay, so the algorithm is actually quite simple. You take image, a mini batch of image, you apply some augmentation, you apply count nets to re get a representation, then apply uh, MLP to get uh, a Z before you do not do this uh, contrastive loss on, on top. Um, there are some uh, important implementation details, um, which is important to get the uh, best numbers. We, we, we use a different batch size. So as a, as a way of uh, studying the importance of batch size, um, although we use quite big batch size uh, from the study, but typically uh, in intermediate batch size could work well. And to stabilize the training for large batch size, we use large optimizer. Um, and then to avoid some shortcuts uh, introduced by batch normalization because of the dependency introduced among uh, different examples in the uh, same mini batch, uh, in the same mini batch in a uh, uh, in a single compute node, if you have a distributed um, computation. So we use global batch norm, which means we aggregate uh, the batch norm statistics over all the cores in the compute nodes. So other than that, um, that's basically the main method. And uh, before going on, is there any question? So it's pretty straightforward and this has been a year old. So I guess many people might have already know. Um, but basically in here, we want to test the method on many image nets, uh, but you also work for CIPA 10 and the MNIST. Um, we didn't put the MNIST result in the paper, but it was state of art. Um, so we, we follow three evaluation protocols. So the first one is linear classifier. We you train a linear classifier on the uh, pre-trained, on the learned features. So we use this as an ablation. And the most people in self-supervised learning community use this one. But uh, when, when you have them pre-trained the model, the best way to get a performance, uh, the way to get the best performance is to fine tune the model. And typically you have fewer labels in the downstream task. So we've also fine tuned the model. And then we also transfer uh, the, the, the model to different data set by fine tuning it on different data sets. Okay. Let me go into some um, um, 
findings of Sinclair paper. So the first one is that data augmentation is very important for contrastive learning. So the first data augmentation, the most important data augmentation in Sinclair is the random cropping. Um, it's still not entirely well understood why random cropping is so important, but intuitively uh, you can see kind of mimicking different um, a pretest task, like if you have random crop like A and a B or C and a D, then given uh, B, you want to predict A, then it's kind of like you're predicting um, a local view given a global view. And if you predict a C given D, then it's, it's like you're predicting a, um, a JSON view. So basically um, you want to encode what's the possible uh, neighboring view of a given view um, using random crop. Let me say it's gonna be robust to occlusion. It's yeah, so so you can yeah, so this definitely be, uh, is kind of simulating a occlusion scenario. But yeah, so in in this case, it's kind of like maybe is there is no overlapping, so it's actually predicting something that that's not occluded. So. Occlusion will be one of the special cases of random crop. <clears throat> okay, so um, <clears throat> so other than random crop, we apply a bunch of we we ablate a bunch of uh, different uh, augmentation like rotation, cutout, Gaussian noise, and the Gaussian blur, so Bell filtering. So um, so yeah, here are some setup in order for us to ablate uh, this uh, augmentation where we want to apply either a single or a pair of augmentation. So let me skip some of the detail, but to show this result here, this is the uh, linear evaluation performance on different augmentation applied. So on the diagonal, uh, diagonal, so only a single augmentation is applied and off diagonal, you apply a pair of augmentation and the last column is average. So what you can see here is if you just apply one augmentation, um, the result is really poor um, compared to the best one. And when you start to compose different type of augmentation together, you see this best number stand out, which is random crop uh, plus color. Um, these two augmentation combined will give you the best result, actually a good result. Otherwise, then the results are pretty poor. So what this means is that random crop is important that we kind of um, expect it. But why color distortion is so important? That's because in the contrastive learning, if you don't apply color distortion, then random crop from the same image, they have very similar color histogram, as you can see on the on figure here. So each row is an image. <clears throat> and once you apply the random crop, then you can see different crop of the same image who have very different color distribution, um, which, uh, disable the, the network to learn some shortcut simply based on color, uh, color distribution. Okay, so these two are the most important data augmentation. So another finding we have here is that uh, we, we increase the strength of color distortion and find that stronger color distortion helps unsupervised contrastive learning a lot, but it doesn't help uh, supervised learning a lot. So before Sinclair, are some people like try to apply auto augment to, you know, like AM, DIM and, uh, and CBC and they apply data augmentation using like auto augment, this kind of augmentation. But if you look at the, uh, the, the simple augmentation, just random crop and the color distor distortion uh, with strong color uh, jittering strains, you can see already surpassed the auto augment, which are search the policy. So, so this way we gain some insight why, uh, so, so the basic reason we want to use a stronger augmentation uh, color distortion is to avoid the shortcut. And, um, and these two sets of augmentation are very important. Okay. Uh, sorry, so someone asked questions in the chat. Uh, what's, it, what's the dimension of the features when you compute the cosine distance? Oh, so that's typically like 128. Yes, I verify so the same. <laughs> Okay. Um, any other questions? Is there any other question? 
Yeah, I have a question. So the so when you're uh, trying to um, evaluate the quality of the um, embeddings, uh, then you're basically trying to do uh, k-nearest neighbors using the cosine, cosine distance on the 128 vector. Uh, no, we actually train a linear classifier. So that's going back to. Correct, correct. Yeah. Okay. Fair enough. But in this case, you would need to know the classes. So it's uh, yeah, you, 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 case. you're just verifying the quality of the features by using a linear classification. Okay. Yeah. So that's what typically people do. But yeah. Also, if you use Nabel, maybe you just want to fine tune it. So we also have fine tuning results. But ablation, we do, uh, we follow the convention. Okay. Um, so so uh, move on from data augmentation. Let's look at the encoder. Uh, in here, what we see is that we try uh, encoder different rest nets with different model size. And you can see that as you increase the number of parameters, unsupervised learning scales, quite Sinclair scales quite well. And if you train longer, which is this uh, red line here, and compared to supervised standard supervised training is kind of closing the gap where you increase the model size. Still, this is a linear evaluation result. So, and another thing we uh, try, to, try to understand is this projection head. In order to figure out the effectiveness of the projection head, uh, we uh, first apply different uh, object projection head. And the first one is the identity mapping where you don't use any projection. And then you have linear projection and the nonlinear projection. So as you can see here, uh, without any projection, you can only use the output dimension of the encoder. Uh, so only have one bar here, which performance uh, evaluated by linear uh, classifier is pretty bad. And so once you use one layer of linear projection, it becomes much better. And uh, non-linear projection are uh, significantly, be significantly better than the linear one in this case. Um, so to understand what happens, so uh, one conjecture is that, so with, with the projection, uh, we, we could separate this representation and uh, the feature we use to contrast different examples. And the feature we use to contrast different examples, it might be invariant to the augmentation you apply to it. Uh, for example, if we apply rotation to it, uh, to not as augmentation, then you can see um, H, which is the input of the projection, and the GH, which is the output of the projection. You use it to predict the notation degree. And you, as you can see, a random guess is 25%. And the output of the projection head only gets 25%, which means it, it loses the information about the notation degree because this gets really uh, task specific. You want to identify uh, the, the positive view in which case could lead to um, false negative in some sense. So using a, a projection head can kind of serving as a buffer uh, where you can maintain a lot of information about the input, useful information about the input. Um, which is more generalizable to a uh, downstream task. Okay, any questions here? Uh, we have a question on the chat. Uh, someone asked, uh, when you do cropping, did you resize to the original image size when you trained the, for the downstream task? Uh, for the downstream task. Uh, so, so standard cropping would be uh, you, it's just like in the inception, I think it's introduced in inception network or Alex. Because when you resized, uh, when you cropping uh, and then you do pre-training, but for the downstream task, you use the original image size. So it shouldn't be proper. Uh, no, so, so typically what, what it works is that you crop it and then you resize it into a standard exactly. size. Like yeah. in image net, you resize it into 224, which is a specific number, yeah. I think from AlexNet. And then for the downstream task, you also resize the image. Yeah. And actually use using different resizing uh, the, the size uh, would lead to different um, numbers performance. Um, but in, in, in this work, we just follow the standard kind of um, ResNet training recipe. I hope you get your answer, Ehsan. Yeah, please keep going. One okay. question is. Uh, in the 
um, in the ablation studies, do you also uh, check the dimensionality required for good classification? I mean, have you tried, for example, going to the extreme case of uh, two dimensions? Oh, you mean for for the input of the projection head or output? Uh, projection head, of course, yeah. Uh, yeah, I, no, we didn't try that small. Um, I mean, why is it uh, 128 dimensions for output? So yeah, it's basically a hyperparameter um, in this case. So we find that the deeper, so as you can see here, as you increase, so actually, yeah, we went back to like 32. You can see the performance is actually stay about the same, maybe slightly better with a larger one, but with increased like 2000 dimension is not helpful. Yeah, thanks. Okay, let me move on to loss function. Um, we basically try different loss function and then find this um, cost entropy loss to work the best. And also we uh, ablate the, the L2 normalization in the, in, in the cross entropy uh, as well as the temperature tau. Without the L2 normalization, the temperature is not useful because it's basically changing the initialization. So as you can see in the top one measure, the binomial classifier is pretty bad compared to the best number here. So adding this L2 norm and the tuna temperature, you get the best number. And what you see is that as you decrease the uh, temperature, then the contrastive accuracy task, task accuracy get increased, which means it's better at uh, the task of finding the, uh, the positive out of the negatives. Um, but, and also the entropy of the prediction become more spiky or more certain about which one is the positive. Uh, but the, the linear evaluation uh, performance becomes worse actually when you're using a, a not so small um, temperature like 0 0.1 or 0 0.2. So that's something um, to increase the number here. Um, so then we also study this uh, scaling problem of training epochs as well as batch size. As you can see, when you train longer, it gets better. Actually, if you continue training, it's continue to get, get better. So it scales really well. And also we try different batch size, find that larger batch size um, seems to be quite helpful. Um, but since then um, we have uh, do more study on the batch size. So in, in original Sinclair paper, it was de de developed using larger batch size. So the hyperparameters are, were not optimized for smaller ones because I simply didn't uh, tune that much for the smaller batch size. So with proper tuning of learning rate temperature or using some deeper projection heads. So the differences in batch size is pretty small as you can see here. So on ImageNet, we're still of ResNet 50 is still using linear eval. As you can see different batch size from 512 to 2000. The differences is rather small across different training epochs. Um, so that's one thing. Another thing is that um, since Sinclair, they have been a lot of work like BYOL, uh, they, um, they show that you don't need to train with negative examples. And one of the benefits is that you probably can train with smaller batch size. As we show that smaller batch size is actually not a, a, a big issue. Of course, if you go to extremely small, like 32 batch size, maybe, yeah, that would be a problem. But so is, is negative example and the batch size a problem? And I think it's probably not. The reason is that in order to perform like large scale pre-training uh, to um, in order to for it to finish in a reasonable amount of time, you basically need a batch size, a big batch size for data par parallelism. Like GPT-3, uh, they use like a, a medium batch size, batch size of a million, which is huge, right? So, so typically you, you need big batch size. Also like compared to BYOL where you don't use negative examples for uh, pre-training, there are some benefits of using negative example, which is that you have explicit control over the negative examples. And also the training, uh, the, the, the tuning for the, for the training is easier, um, you know, for, for monitoring the number because you can explicitly see how well the model does in terms of you know, uh, predicting the positive out of negative versus, versus in 
um, BYOL, you kind of have to, um, you know, then the, the, the loss could be small, but it could be collapsing uh, in an implicit way. So you don't really know if, whether or not the, the task get better or if the representation kind of start to collapse. Yeah, I think uh, uh, your point is completely valid for BYOL. Uh, I, I think they mentioned because of batch normalization, they do not collapse. But I still quite not sure why. Is that yeah, it's, it's a mystery. I think there are a bunch of other factors as well, uh, not just batch normalization, and they're clearly Maybe seems because to be of different ways. Um, also, like like this predictor, and also like EMA. So they all have uh, some some way of uh, compacting the, uh, the the collapsing. But one question is, it might not be like black and white, right? It could be there might be some gray area where you have partial collapsing or something like that. So it's it's I I find it a little bit difficult to. Uh, debug or, or monitor what exactly is going on uh, versus in, in this case where you construct the, the, the negatives so um, the model has no way to cheat but rather solve the task of course if there are some features that's like color distortion uh, is not applied for example then the model could cheat by using uh, shortcuts but this uh, phenomena will be persistent for both uh, basically for all contrastive learning methods Yes, and someone asked questions. Uh, what hyperparameters you tune to help a smaller batch size? Oh, so yeah, so that's some. Sorry, let me go back here. So there are some details, like I think mostly in the learning rate, um, because for smaller batch. So I use a linear scaling learning rate, um, like linear linear schedule learning rate, which means if I double the batch size, I double the learning rate. But I tune the learning rate at the larger batch size because of the that would be faster to train. So I train like for 4,000 batch size. And then in order to figure out the batch uh, learning rate for like 512, for example, I simply scale it linearly according right. to previous work. And you but it turned out- Yeah, you still use the last optimizer? Yeah, I'm using last optimizer. It turned out for NAS, you, where you should scale the, learning, scale the learning rate is square root instead of linear. Right. So that helps a, a bit and also some temperature and, and the deeper projection can also seems to be helpful um, on that. So yeah, I think if you tune the hyperparameter for smaller learning rates, you could improve the numbers. Uh, although I think if you go even smaller, like 128, I think BYOL and, and to be fair, like um, and, and the momentum in contrast will be doing better mm -hmm. um, because that batch size is too small. Mm -hmm. um, that's for, for, for ImageNet, for, uh, for Siva 10, you could do like uh, 128, and that's basically the same as a thousand batch size. Yeah. So it dep also depends on the data set, yeah. but it's fair to say, I, I mean, like if you want to train on large data set, one seems to finish in a reasonable amount of time, like maybe within one week, you want to use larger batch size mm -hmm. as showcased by like GPT-3, which use a, a million batch size, more, more than a million batch size, anyway. So that's something to comment on. Um, so compared to state of art, we in this work we compare to many works uh, before, Sinclair, including AMDA, DIM, C CMC, Moco, and stuff, uh, PIR. So, um, so basically, in terms of linear evaluation, our model kind of doing way above uh, the other methods, and many other methods uh, could be quite complicated in some sense. Um, and in terms of semi-supervised learning, we are also doing quite well. Uh, in this case, we fine tune the model in either uh, with either 1% of the labels or 10% of the labels. We also transfer uh, the model to different downstream tasks. And we use both linear and the fine tuning um, as transfer methods. And then the, the baseline here is the uh, supervised model trained with the same augmentation and the same training epochs. As you can see that um, Sinclair on uh, transfer slightly better than the supervised pre-training on ImageNet, but it does not require any labels in the pre-training. Mm -hmm. So um, 
I think someone mentioned that using the k nearest neighbor to do the evaluation. So here is an example where we show k nearest neighbor of querying examples images on the uh, leftmost column. As you can see in a similar, like, yeah, the, 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 the retrieved top k examples are quite similar to the querying one. So it learns semantic um, of the, the, the image quite well. So basically, yeah, Synclear, to conclude, Synclear is a simple uh, and effective self-supervised learning framework. And uh, it's basically a combination or a recipe of different design choices rather than a single um, uh, design choice. And yeah, and our study uh, showed different important factors for effective representation learning. Uh, before moving to Synclear V2, is there any questions? Uh, I have a question about the uh, false negatives, but maybe I can leave it to ask you at the end how to handle the false negative when you compute the constructive learning. For example, this nearest neighbor that you show, there might be some negative images that uh, pretty look like similar to a positive case. Uh, yeah, I, I may have, I may have just them yeah. right now. <laughs> If you don't mind. So basically, um, I think it's kind of um, subjective. I think uh, the proposed projection head and the temperature together play a role for negative examples because, as you see, uh, the if you don't have projection head, then the representation would be kind of tailored very specific for this task, which in, induce a lot of negatives, right? So okay, let me just mention one quick observation on MNIST. So if you train MNIST on MNIST um, and you use a, a batch size of 512 or 1000, right? Mm -hmm. So you guarantee that in the same mini batch, you will have very similar, mm -hmm. like it's really similar digits um, from the same class. Um, but that could still work. If you train a linear classifier on top of uh, the, the precision network, you, you can get like 99.5 uh, accuracy. So the pre-trained network is doing extremely well. Um, but now if you remove the projection head and then this representation will be very specific to distinguishing like one writing of two and the other slightly different writing of two, right? So that will, that will be bad. So projection head, I think to play a role. And the other thing is the temperature where when you reduce the temperature to a very small number is it becomes very, so let me show you here. Um, well, when you decreasing the temperature and the entropy of the prediction becomes very small, which means it becomes extremely confident at picking up positive out of negatives. So it has to kind of, uh, so if you make small diff uh, mistakes, like not distinguishing different writing of two, then you get largely penalized because you're not doing very well in this task. Mm -hmm. But as you increase the temperature to then something like one or 0 0.1, then you're not so much penalized by not predicting the positive one, uh, the, the positive example. So it basically is kind of like a label smoothing in some sense where um, you want to predict the distribution while maintaining the positive example being high in probability, but not that high. Mm -hmm. and, and you have this softer probability over all the similar images in a mini batch. So you, I think that's prob probably will happen. And then if you look at the k nearest neighbor, um, it could still look quite similar. So the mm -hmm. distribution uh, is quite soft over in the mini batch yeah. by tuning the temperature. Use it for the the question couldn't hear it. Uh, do you hear me? Yes, yes, yeah. we can hear you. Okay, sorry. So I have a question regarding the regularization that uh, actually I'd better say regarding the projection that you have uh, in your model. Do you think it's acting uh, like the contrast for learning as a too a strong regularization that you need to separate that from the learned latent features? Because at the end, what's happening is that you are applying the contrastive learning on the projected head, right? And then you are using the features basically one or two layers before uh, for downstream tasks. 
Does yeah. that mean that the contrastable learning is like too much of a regularizer that might be hurting for downstream tasks? Well, I think, yeah, so as I mentioned before, like I think one factor is uh, like you don't want a feature to be a very specific for the task, which there might be a lot of false negative, um, right? Because you want to distinguish the exact uh, positive view uh, out of a lot of negative, which could also be positive if you consider in the class labels. So I think that could be one of the reason. Okay, and uh, regarding these samples that you are picking, it's based on the projection head similarity or the latent features? So these are based on the features. So actually projection head output is doing fair. It's, so if you look at the number of differences uh, in terms of, so in here, if you, well, if you use projection head and you, you try to use uh, the input of the projection head and the output of the projection head, there is like 10% or more than 10% differences in terms of linear evaluation accuracy. But 10% is a lot in terms of, you know, something, but, but it's still, if you look at the uh, nearest neighbor, it's still doing uh, fair, but just input is out to the projection head is better. Okay. Okay, thanks. Any other questions? For me, that's it. Thank you. Oh, yeah, you can keep going. Okay, let me move on to uh, Simply V2, which is kind of try to address uh, the semi supervised learning setup. So, you know, as most of you know, that uh, you have a lot of data, but most of them might not have labels. So, how, how, we, how can we utilize those unlabeled data to really help in the task? So, to address this, we study this problem on ImageNet where all unable images are available, um, but only a small fraction of images are enabled, like 1% or 10%. And then we want to do the best in the ImageNet, uh, you know, validation steps. So if we review like un un semi-supervised learning, we know there are two uh, paradigms. The first is based on the task agnostic use of unable data. Um, the, the reason it is task ag agnostic is because when, you, when we do pre-training, we don't know when the downstream task is, right? So you use the unable data, but you completely have no idea what the downstream task is. And until you fine tune it on the downstream task, you know um, when the task is. But there's, there's another way of use, using uh, like unable data um, which is exemplified by like self-training, pseudo enable or some kind of consistent regularization. So when you use the enable data, you kind of directly use it as a regularizer for the task you have at hand. So in this, in this paper, in Synclear V2, and the question we ask is, can we kind of combine the best of these two words together? Um, so this is the framework we kind of come up with so the, the first thing we do is we still do Sinclair type of pre-training, which is like task agnostic pre-training. And then we fine tune it, this, the, the pipeline is very similar to Sinclair pre-training and the fine tune. And then after fine tuning, what, what we do is another step, which you can call it like um, self-training mm -hmm. or desolation. So what we do is that we use the pre-train, fine tune the model to Enable the unable data set um, to generate some soft label on the unable data set. And then we train a student network uh, on top of this teacher's prediction on the unable data set. So this is different from desolation. In a sense, desolation use mostly use um, label data set. And it's very similar to um, self-training or pseudo label, but we use a soft distribution uh, from the teacher side. So this basically is a framework where you can con combine the pre-training and the self-training together in, in a single uh, framework. So let me go into some details of what the changes in the Sinclair V2. Uh, so I don't have to go over this. So one thing we try in Sinclair V2 is using deeper and, the, and, and deeper ResNet basically bigger as well. Um, 
And another thing is that we use deeper projection heads and we try to fine tune from a middle layer. And it seems when you have a small number of label examples, fine tune from some middle layer seems to be better. Uh, but this is kind of minor point. So for desolation with unable data, um, we could be a little bit more specific, which is that, so with a lot of uh, unable data where you don't have labels, right? You just have X here. And then uh, you use a teacher network, which is pre-trained and fine-tuned. And then you can label the, the, the data uh, using its output uh, probability. And then you train a student to match that. So this is what exactly I mean by a desolation on unable data sets. So the first finding in Sinclair V2 is that bigger models are more label efficient. Um, what I mean by that is as you increase uh, the, the model size, um, so the improvement for fewer uh, percentage of labels is small. Um, because I think like conventionally you might think if you have fewer uh, labels, you want to train a smaller model. But for unsupervised learning is a very different story. When you have fewer labels, you want to pre-train model to be big and fine tuning, even fine tuning on small percent, like 1% of labels is just like 13 images, about 13 images per image net classes. So even that um, you can gain a lot by having a big pre-trained network. So a more specific example is that if you increase the model size by 10X, then you could reduce uh, the required enables to achieve certain accuracy by 10, 10x. So if you don't have, uh, so if enabling is enabling data is more expensive than increasing the model size or compute, then you should increase the model size or compute. So that's basically what it shows. Um, but yeah, but since then, so this was like um, pub or archive released. The paper was released in May last year. Uh, but since then, the GPT-3, they, they exactly show the same point, right? If you have uh, a huge model, then like zero shot learning would be more effective um, with bigger models. Um, but anyway, so <laughs> yep. any questions? So basically the message would be, uh, there are more patterns to, to explore on the unlabeled data. That's why we need the larger network to discover those patterns. Yeah, yeah. And of course, if you have bigger model or larger model, one um, kind of concern is when you fine tune on smaller labels, wouldn't you just overfit it, right? Because yeah, it's yeah, easier it to overfit, but yeah. it doesn't. So that's kind of kind of surprising. So it doesn't overfit. So that's kind of surprising. But I think it's also reasonable because if in pre-training you already learn all the different classes, now fine tuning is super easy, right? You just assign label to it. Mm -hmm. So it's probably the, the overfitting issue is not that big if you really have a good pre-training. You yeah. just assign able to whatever you discover before. So the overfitting might not be a big issue there. Mm -hmm. So that's my conjecture. But basically, yeah, you, you want a pre-training to have a big model. Okay, so the, so the effects of the projection heads, we also study this and we find that um, deeper projection heads seems to be helpful, especially for fewer percentage of labels. If you have a lot of labels for fine tuning, then deeper projection head doesn't seem to be that helpful. Um, but also when you have fewer labels, you want to fine tune from a middle layer of the projection head, typically the, the, the first layer of projection head. But if you have more labels, then you just fine tune from the first layer, the input of the projection head. And this is some smaller point that we discovered. So this plot shows the, the benefits of uh, using unable data for distillation. So the, the blue curve here is the baseline uh, where you just fine tune the model. And then if you do an, a self distillation, then you can see like the, the curve is lift up uh, by a significant percent. And the, the, the best curve here are uh, distilled from the best, um, the largest uh, self distilled model here. And you can see that uh, is kind of suppressing, even with 10% of labels, 
uh, we are doing as good as using 100% of labels uh, from supervised learning. Sorry, I uh, do not quite understand the difference between the, the red and the green. The, uh, the difference between the red and the green one. Oh, uh, you mean this, this yeah, one? Yeah, exactly. Oh yeah, so so this, so the green, so this one is self distillation. So every point like here is from here, they distill to itself right. to the same model architecture. But the uh, green curve is uh, the, the model distilled from the biggest model in here. Even the student model. Yeah, it's like a second time distillation basically. Right. From, so we first do a self distillation like, so how we get the, the point in here, for example, you first do a self desolation of largest model in the blue curve here to get to here. And then you do uh, another uh, desolation on unable data to get here, but the model size is smaller in here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you can imagine like uh, this blue curve from blue curve to a red curve or orange curve <coughs> is, uh, is, is kind of self training. And then the uh, other is I'm just not sure why a student model should work better than teacher model because uh, there is no extra information that a student model can use. I mean, use the tar teacher model to create a pseudo labels and then use those as a kind of supervision for the student model, right? Yeah, so I think there are uh, uh, multiple factors here, like just doing, um, so, so one factor is that you use unable data set. Mm -hmm. So you, you see like more examples. Mm -hmm. um, and then the teacher model is producing a soft label. So there, there might be some regularization effects. And also um, the, the labels are kind of specific to, so even if you already have the labels uh, from a hard label or ground truth, when you do random crop, the, the label might be different. Mm -hmm. So the teacher model is able to kind of um, like if you have a person and there is a, a big background and you crop in the background and then you still say this is a t person, mm -hmm. that's the label going to say, but the teacher is going to say, oh, that's this the is the background, yeah. for example. Now the teacher is able to provide some um, better guidance for training mm -hmm. the students. Mm -hmm. So I think that's maybe one of the reason to for the improvement. Right. But anyway, so here, yeah, shows the power of self-training or self desolation And then um, here in this table shows that when you do desolation or self-training, you'd better use uh, unable data sets because if you just use, so this is the first row is neighbor only training. And the second one is neighbor with uh, desolation loss on the neighbor set. So you see improvements, but that's not a, a big enough improvement. So when, when you use desolation, you can use unable data sets and that give you a big improvement here. Okay, so here are some comparison to state of art, but we could probably skip that. Um, so basically we show that uh, combining pre-training and uh, self-desolation or self-training is a very effective approach of using unable data for you know, semi-supervised learning. And the code is also available. So due to the time, probably I should move on to uh, the third part of the talk, which is the final part of the talk on the intriguing properties of contrastive losses. So we know that the contrastive loss is basically uh, cross entropy loss is super effective. Um, but what, what is it actually doing under the hood? So that's something we um, have been wondering. So one way to generalize the contrastive loss in here is that we can write it as an alignment loss between, between the, which is to encourage the representation of augmented views to be consistent. And there is another distribution loss, which is to encourage the representation, a random subset of the representations to match some prior distribution of high entropy, like Gaussian distribution. So that's a way of generalizing the standard contrastive loss. Let's see why that's a generalization. So first we can rewrite the uh, contrastive loss uh, using Sinclair and the many works um, can be 
rewriting in this way where you can see the first term is uh, basically your alignment term where you want the similarity between positive views to be uh, similar, to be high. And then the second term, which is this uh, log sum S term uh, in some previous work from MIT, they have already shown this could match a uh, uniform distribution uh, in the hypersphere. So it's a special case in the sense where you choose this distribution to be uniform distribution in the hypersphere. So in this work, we ask, can we kind of uh, using other distribution, prior distribution and how, how that affects performance. So uniform hypersphere is basically one of them. And then you can use Gaussian or uniform hypercube. Um, but there are of course other prior distribution that we can explore, but in this work, we stay with simple ones. Now, one question uh, of using different prior distribution is that you couldn't use standard cross entropy laws, which has this uh, log sign X, which correspond to uh, hypersphere. Now, in order to do that, I'm probably going to skip this. We use a uh, um, size versus than distance basically to measure the, the representation and the prior distribution. So what you do is that given the activation vector in the same mini batch, uh, you generate some random orthogonal uh, matrix, and then you project both prior as well as the, the activation in a batch side, in, in the same batch then you kind of measure some distance and this is differentiable so you can kind of uh, minimize the distance. So basically this uh, using the size washes and distance allow us to uh, use different priors. So for the alignment term, they are still going to be the same where you minimize the normalized uh, distance, L2 distance uh, between the <clears throat> the representation of the same uh, augmentation pair. But for the prior distribution, we can use different ones and we can use slice versus the distance to, to, to do that. Um, so how does this connect to mutual information? So, so in, in, in previous work, it has been shown that um, info NC loss uh, is a cross entropy loss. It's a lower bound on the mutual information uh, between two views, um, and then if we do, if we have, if we have a generalized contrastive loss, then uh, we didn't show any mathematical uh, proof. But by comparing this um, formulation and the mutual information, we can see that the alignment loss is um, connected to uh, the conditional entropy, which is try to reduce reduce the uncertainty of the other view given one view of the example. And then distribution loss is connected to the entropy, um, uh, the entropy loss in the, in, in the mutual information, which is trying to increase the entropy of the representation. So yeah, so basically given this generalization, one question we want to ask is, does it get you any, anywhere better um, by using you know, different priors and it turned out is is kind of a negative result where using different um, prior give you more or less uh, the same performance. As you can see here, when you train longer in the curve and uh, the performance of different um, generalized the loss uh, is about the same. And uh, in ImageNet, actually, if you use the deeper projection head, then performance of different loss is still about the same. So basically what this says is that um, at least for the priors that we have tried, um, generalized contrastive loss has minimum um, effectiveness um, um, on, on the performance, on increasing the performance basically. But now there's something interesting here is that if we look at the, the lambda turn in the general, uh, generalized contrastive loss, it actually has something to do with the temperature in the standard cross entropy loss. So as you increase the um, lambda turn, you can see the projection of the hidden the projection of the hidden vectors into uh, one dimension um, is more and more Gaussian like because you enforce it to match some prior Gaussian distribution. 
And for the standard cross entropy loss, as you decrease the temperature, is also going to be more Gaussian like. When you increase the temperature, it is less a Gaussian like uh, because it's mapped to a uniform hypersphere. So basically, we can kind of draw a conclusion where the lambda um, is kind of inverse correlated to the temperature in the standard cross entropy loss um, to some extent. Yeah, so here is some more study, but I probably should skip this. So um, the final part of you this- You have a time if you want to continue. You have a time, I mean, don't worry about the time. Okay, sounds good. I'm about to wrap up as well. But so the final part uh, is about the feature suppression in the, in the contrastive learning, which is um, as, as I already kind of talked about in the beginning where if you have, um, when you use um, contrastive learning, the data augmentation is really important because it removes some easy to learn features from the contrastive loss, uh, from the contrastive loss such as color statistics. Um, so here we want to study this in like more, um, in a more controlled setup. So what we do here is, so first let me cl clarify one concept of competing features. Um, these are the different features shared uh, between augmented views. So for example, um, between these views, what you can see in common is it could be uh, the class of an object, but also could be color distribution, right? In here, the color distribution is different, but the class of an object is stay, stay about the same. So, so to study this quantitatively, so first thing we do is we create a um, data set with explicit, explicit and controllable competing features. So one thing uh, we do is we add random bits to add, in addition to RGB channels. So we know how much random features we added. And by applying the simply augmentation, we're not going, we we're going to keep the additional random bits uh, the same across different views. And the conclusion here is that as you increase the bits in the random feature that you add to the data, uh, you can see the linear evaluation performance drop very, very quickly. Um, you can tr try to tune different temperature to kind of um, prevent this dropping uh, very quickly, but still a few bits, like 15 bits of information added, it could be dropping to almost random. And using, you know, um, momentum contrast where you have a lot of negative example or directly increase the batch size, um, they all like fail to prevent this drop of um, performance, which means if you have a few bits of trivial information to extract between two views, then the model will learn nothing basically. Mm -hmm. um, now we also do this for MNIST and ImageNet is similar trains. And one interesting thing is if you train a rational autoencoder, which doesn't work very well for like ImageNet scale, but on MNIST, you actually, when you add bits, you're actually able to preserve the, info, um, the performance quite well, um, even up to 30 bits, but um, for contrastive learning, like for an optimal temperature of 0 0.1 for the standard case of 0 0.2, now you just need like 10 to 15 bits to completely destroy the algorithm. So, so this is one set of study, which you, you might find a little bit uh, artificial because of the setup, the way we add the, the information, the, the bits. So another way is slightly more natural that we add this competing feature is to overlay these endless digits on top of image net images. So as you can see here, um, one digit is replicated um, across the image uh, putting multiple places. And the, so the, the, the most columns except in the first one, uh, you know, random, random crop. As you can see that um, <clears throat> uh, most of the random crop contains these endless digits. Now we can control how many number of unique endless digits to add in the data set. So as we find that as you increase uh, the number of unique endless digits to add, um, the performance of image net classification using linear classifier uh, is dropping quite significantly. And uh, 
for MNIST classification is become better. So what this basically show is that, um, because in this case, MNIST features and ImageNet object features are competing features. So you can see the simple features, which is MNIST features, um, suppress, largely suppress the learning of uh, the, the harder features, which is, excuse me, <coughs> which is the object class features in ImageNet, right? Uh, whereas, uh, whereas in, in supervised learning, when you add these uh, amnesty digits, they, they have minimum impact. So it's not the model capacity not able to learn the feature, but rather and there's one set of feature that's simple to learn, easy to learn, and then it suppress the other. And there is no good way to get rid of them. So uh, another set of uh, data set that we construct is slightly more realistic than that is you have multiple MNIST digits in, in the same canvas. And then we're going to fix one set of one, one digit to be a uh, fixed size and increasing uh, the size of the other MNIST digits. And then the goal is try to learn the, the, the feature that's good for classifying both uh, digits of both sizes. As you can see in the, in the table here, when you increase the size of uh, the second digit while fixing the first one fixed, um, the performance of the first digits just get much worse. Smaller digits uh, is just get much worse uh, to the level uh, when, when this like bigger digits gets like really big, as you can see in here. Now the, the linear classifier for the smaller digit is fall back to almost as like a random network, slightly better than a random network, but much worse than uh, what it could be when both digits are of the same size. So again, you, you see this uh, strong feature suppression effect from larger object features to you know, small object features. So to conclude in this part of the talk, we um, basically propose the, and study the generalization of contrastive loss. Basically here is the negative result where when you change it different um, prior, it doesn't actually change in the performance. Um, but we also show these strong uh, suppression effects among competing features and easier features, you know, is quickly dominated the learning and the suppressing the learning of harder features or um, the, the, the smaller set of features. So that's basically what I have for today.